today's uh, presentation is part of a larger project in process uh, to look at dealer exhibitions of Chinese paintings uh, in museums in the 1950s. And since the early 20th century, Chinese art dealers have produced exhibition catalogs and held exhibitions of objects from their inventories in their own gallery spaces, both in Asia and in North America and Europe. But in the decades following World War II, curators organized exhibitions of pre-modern Chinese art for museums that often included a generous selection of works borrowed from dealers and private collectors, in addition to pictures from institutional holdings. So my study today delves into the little known phenomenon of dealer organized exhibitions of Chinese art designed for and exhibited in North American museums during the 50s. Now I explore this practice today through the lens of the lone exhibition of Chinese paintings organized by New York dealer Frank Caro, which toured Canada and the United States in 1956 and 1957. And as you'll see uh, later in the talk, the exhibition includes uh, 52 paintings from Caro's inventory and eight works from other sources, including loans from the Nelson Atkins Gallery, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, C.C. Wong, and Toronto collector R.W. Finlayson. Now this uh, research draws upon archival materials, including dealer inventory, cards and invoices, handwritten annotations in surviving catalogs, gallery photographs, provenance records, and research and the paintings themselves. And today, I hope this presentation critically examines the historical circumstances that prompted these dealer exhibitions and the roles of museum curators as collaborators and customers. It also considers the impact of this particular show by tracing the circulation and sale of paintings uh, at the conclusion of the show, during the show, and many years after. Thus, this research contributes to conversations about exhibiting Chinese art beyond its country of origin. Okay, so many, many of you are familiar with C.T. Lu and his many uh, escapades. Many of you probably were uh, participants in or um, audience to the recent C.T. Lu Revisited uh, new sources and perspectives on the market for Asian art in the 20th century symposium that took place uh, in December of last year, co-organized by the Freer Sackler, the Museum of Asian Art in Berlin, and the Museum Riedberg in Zurich. Um, and as you probably uh, heard in many of the talks, lots of new research, but in general, um, studies of Lu end in 1950. And so although um, Lou had lots of exhibitions and you see his sort of signature catalog cover here on the left, um, an exhibition of Chinese stone sculptures with a capital S for, for Stan um, from 1940 with an introduction by the German emigre scholar, uh, Alfred Salmony. And then um, the well-known um, exhibition from 1950 arranged for um, the Norton Gallery in 1950, of which Ralph Norton purchased 40 jades uh, from this exhibition that are still in the Norton collection today, upon which Jenny So has uh, written and spoken quite extensively and, and well. So um, C.T. Liu is having a variety of liquidation sales in New York in 1950. He's starting to step back from the business, a lot of his donations of large mural paintings or statues, heads of statues uh, that happened earlier are starting to wane. And uh, painting has never been particularly one of C.T. Liu's specialties, although he had lots of paintings in his inventory. He often relied on others uh, to evaluate paintings. And as he's starting to step back uh, in 1950, Frank Caro is starting to come to the fore. And this famous image that I'm sure several of you have seen before, uh, you see Frank Caro here next to Alan Priest and Ashwin uh, Lip, and then C.T. Liu on the end. Um, Frank Caro bills himself on stationery, um, a lot of galleries, a lot of other sorts of sales invoices as the successor of C.T. Liu. And this is part of his imprimatur um, as he goes forward in business. But Lou is less involved in the day-to-day -day and particularly in the sale 
uh, and circulation of paintings and organization of this particular exhibition and its many stops. So I love this picture for a variety of reasons here on the right. Frank Caro is front and center looking at an inscription with Ash Ashwin Lippi, who was very good at, uh, was very good at Chinese. Uh, and then C.T. Lu sort of off to the side on the left and Alan Priest isn't looking at the painting at all. Um, so um, this is a scene from 1950, which really sort of ushers in this new era of the way these paintings from Lu and later Caro's inventory uh, are circulating in the United States and in Canada. So the main exhibition I'm gonna talk about today um, is a traveling show uh, called the initially the Lone Exhibition of Chinese Paintings, organized by Frank Caro, um, initially for the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, though that was not the first stop of this exhibition, as we'll see in a few moments. Now, paintings for this exhibition, um, like many of the paintings in Lou's inventory in, uh, inherited by Caro, uh, come from a variety of sources. Uh, most were noted as coming out of China between 1947 and 1949 from collections such as Zhang Song Yu, Jean Pierre de Bosque, Tan Jing, Zhang Da Qian, and many others. And I will save uh, exactly where and when and how much for maybe the Q&A period. But dealer costs for these uh, paintings were typically in the hundreds of dollars, typically 100 to 400 dollars. Um, so very low, even when paintings were selling for today, we might think kind of crazy at the $2,000 to $8,000 mark. So as we consider this exhibition, um, let's think about the historical circumstances for these types of exhibitions. Um, now today, what, holding a dealer's exhibition in a museum would be considered a perilous conflict of interest, although such shows were fairly common in the 1930s and 40s and even into the 50s. And some of these exhibitions represented the holdings of single dealers, while others incorporated the, we the wares of a variety of dealers. Now, shows like these in 1949 and 54 sort of set the stage for the Caro organized exhibition of Chinese paintings that I'm mainly focusing on today. So Jean-Pierre Dubosc, who had connections to C.T. Lu, uh, once married to his daughter and in China, uh, getting together his own collection of fan paintings and a lot of hand scroll uh, and hanging scroll paintings from the Ming and Qing, uh, held his own exhibition for one month in New York, um, which included a few paintings from other collections, but the majority was hit from his collection. Though it wasn't really a selling exhibition, it was really kind of a Ming and Qing painting promotion project uh, to try and uh, sway taste among curators and scholars, as well as um, other collectors toward Ming and Qing, something that was uh, starting to happen in the post-war period. Now on the right, you see an exhibition uh, called Chinese Landscape Painting held at the Cleveland Museum of Art in 1954. Those of you who know my work know a lot about this exhibition. I've written about it and spoken about it in the past. Um, this was organized by Sherman Lee when he was still curator at the museum and not yet director. And it was one of, it was the largest exhibition of paintings from a variety of dealers, um, museums, private collectors, and the Cleveland Museum of Art uh, to happen in the post-war period. And it uh, generated a catalog and uh, a new edition, uh, and then also a paperback edition that helped to shape the canon, a canon of uh, Chinese painting in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. So the, this is sort of the backdrop for exhibitions that are happening around this time. So just two years later in 1956-57, the Caro exhibition takes off uh, across Canada and the United States. Now, Museums and dealers considered these shows to be mutually beneficial at the time. Institutions were able to present exhibitions that their own collections not be, might not be able to support. And you see some of the names uh, here on this itinerary for the show uh, did not have large collections of Chinese paintings in the 1950s. And it would be a chance to draw more visitors, expose them to Chinese art and curators got the chance to examine potential acquisitions for an extended period of time. 
They could also introduce local benefactors to works, uh, perhaps um, stimulating a gift to the institution or setting up the possibility of a future loan from a local collector. And dealers especially like this arrangement because they would usually sell a few objects to museums or private collectors as a result of these shows. And perhaps more important than any initial sales, however, was the prestige and legitimacy that these shows generated, which helped dealers command higher prices for their objects in the future. The introductions that curators wrote for accompanying catalogs magnified these effects as they amounted to an endorsement or even authentication of a dealer's wares. So the tour of this exhibition doesn't in fact start at the Royal Ontario Museum as this catalog cover might suggest, but in Winnipeg at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. And so this is um, a show that comes with about two thirds of the paintings that end up in uh, the Royal Ontario Museum version of the show. Uh, there is a small catalog for this show with um, a local introduction and all of the paintings are from Caro. There aren't any loan paintings uh, from other collectors or museums in this first part of the show. And we'll see as this show moves across Canada and the US that composition changes. There are different catalogs, different introductions, uh, different selections of paintings. And some of this reflects um, the acquisition of paintings by museums and private collectors as the show goes across North America and others suggest that um, the uh, sort of major part of the exhibition trying to set it up as a loan exhibition really um, ends uh, in Portland and it becomes more of an exhibition of Caro's paintings for sale once it arrives in uh, Stanford. So unlike exhibitions today where we might have a selection of institutional loans, private collector loans, even perhaps dealer loans, which are much less common today in exhibitions, here, this was really meant to be a selling exhibition. All of the paintings that Caro uh, included in the exhibition were part of his inventory. They were actively for sale. Um, and part of the inventory cards that trace the selection of paintings and where they went shows all their visits to museums and in between how they traveled to different collectors and others to um, for potential purchase and who looked at them and how much and all of that. So as we consider where this show went, um, it's probably the show that reached the largest variety of people in North America during the 1950s. The exhibition in Cleveland and another in a smaller exhibition in LACMA in 1948, as well as the Wildenstein, Wildenstein show by Dubosk of Megan Shink painting in New York, uh, all were one venue, rather short amount of time. However, this exhibition went from Winnipeg to Toronto, then to Portland, uh, then on to Stanford, uh, Zanesville, Ohio, uh, Iowa City, and San Diego. And so it uh, toured places where many, audience had many audiences had not been exposed to much Chinese art or Chinese paintings before. And it had uh, a, large, a large impact given that we don't see um, sort of widespread touring of a Chinese painting exhibition until we get to the Chinese art treasure show from the National Palace Museum in 1961 and 62. So um, if we were to make a t-shirt for this tour, this is sort of what it would look like. So um, each uh, stop on the tour is roughly a month, though it does spend uh, several months in the fall at Stanford University in 1957. Um, and throughout these uh, tours and throughout the catalogs and the publicity for the exhibition, it always says organized by Frank Caro, successor to C.T. Lu. So he's still playing on that C.T. Lu name recognition, but also making it really clear that he's the one offering these paintings. Um, and in several cases, um, C.T. Lu and his name are minimized and Caro is more brought to the fore. And Caro's choice of curators to work with in creating the catalog also shows this shift from C.T. Lu's 
uh, reliance on people like Cece Wong and Jean-Pierre Dubosc to a shift in who Caro is working with, mainly in Boston. So what kinds of paintings were in this show? Um, for example, let's uh, take a look at a couple of these. Uh, regrettably, because of the long uh, uh, pandemic, um, staying at home, not being able to travel even to Canada, uh, I have uh, images of paintings rather than installation shots at this point, but you should have a good idea of uh, what things look like. All right, so here we have uh, two loans from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston that appeared in this exhibition, uh, number one and number three in the catalog. So this would have been in the first room of the show. Um, and notice that um, this uh, painting from the Museum of Arts, Fine Arts Boston came in 1956. So immediately uh, put in this exhibition, whereas an older painting attributed to Xia Gui that came in in 1914 is another selection um, to push this exhibition back uh, into the Song Dynasty. Um, another uh, a very famous painting by Jiang Shen, Verdant Mountains from the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art um, was actually purchased by Lauren Sickman from Frank Caro in 1953. And surprise, surprise, it's in this exhibition as well. And so those of you who know the, deal, the German expatriate dealer, Walter Hochstetter, and uh, my previous work on him know that several exhibitions that he um, donated paintings to or loaned paintings to, he was a dealer collector, also had a, a kind of link between people he had sold paintings to before that were loaning things to the exhibition as well as things that he owned personally and was either hoping to sell or show off in his collection. So this is a pretty common phenomenon happening in the 50s with the major dealers uh, that we see. Uh, also in this exhibition, uh, a loan from uh, R.W. Finlayson uh, of Toronto, who is probably best known for Shitao and Bada Shanren uh, collecting uh, of paintings. This is now in the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. And then also uh, C.C. Wong, uh, the collector and painter and connoisseur based in New York City by this time, also uh, had eight paintings, sorry, six paintings in this show. Um, many of which it turned out to be for sale. Um, this one eventually ended up in the Princeton University Art Museum uh, in 1979. So who did, um, who did Frank Caro collaborate with to um, offer these paintings, to prepare the catalog? He worked with mainly people in Boston. Uh, Kojiro Tomita, who was curator of Asian art circa 1913 to the 1960s. And I really wanted to find pictures of the 50s, so um, excuse this picture of him digging, but I thought it would be appropriate for, uh, for today's talk since we heard from Fletcher uh, earlier about Langdon Warner. So here he is planting a tree at Langdon Warner Memorial at Horyuchi in 1958. So um, Tomita wrote a, um, an introduction for the ROM catalog, kind of uh, vouching for it and praising Caro and the paintings. But it was really another curator, um, another researcher, Zhang Qianzhi, uh, sorry, Zhang Qianqi, who did the bulk of the research and, um, and worked on the catalog most intensively in March of 1956. And records indicate that lar a large group of paintings was sent to Boston for Tsung to work on uh, for roughly two months, um, that March and April of 1956 to uh, transcribe and translate inscriptions, to note seals, put together uh, somewhat of a bibliography and prepare a short summary of the artists, all in English that were to appear not only in the Winnipeg and Rom version of the catalogs, but others um, as well. Okay. So this might be the t-shirt that Sung had for his part of the exhibition. So here are some of the acquisitions uh, that came out of this show. Interestingly, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston uh, purchased six things, that should be surprising. Um, this Bada Shanren painting was actually something Caro purchased from Zhang Daqian in 1956, the same year as the exhibition, and then it went to Boston. So it's a very small world. Uh, also this painting uh, purchased by Li Yin in 1956. 
um, this peach blossom spring, which many of you probably know from the same year, um, to others, uh, roaming among mountains and rivers, and um, autumn view of Tongguan here, uh, both in 1956. And then later in the same year, this magnificent Shitao painting. Um, and uh, Zhang Daqian and Wang Fang Yu and a lot of others in the circle of Zhang Tianji uh, used to say that uh, Zhang was the best judge of Shitao paintings and Zhang Daqian wanted him to keep a lookout for Shitao paintings. However, this one proved uh, too pricey for Zhang Daqian and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston uh, took it in. Now, Cleveland also uh, purchased things from this exhibition. And you might think that uh, these were institutional purchases orchestrated by Sherman Lee, but in fact, they weren't. Um, what we find from the inventory cards and the records and the invoices for this is that most of these paintings, um, the four that came out of this exhibition that went to Cleveland, um, were purchased soon after the exhibition, like this one in 1956, but they weren't purchased by Lee. They were purchased by a woman named Helen Wade Green Perry, who was a Cleveland collector of Chinese and Japanese paintings and a lover of a tea practice. And she was uh, the person who funded a lot of these acquisitions from the Caro show for the Cleveland Museum of Art because Lee had just bought a lot of paintings for his 1954 show, uh, Chinese Landscape Painting. And so he worked with Mrs. Perry to purchase a whole lot of uh, these paintings and others, many of them UN paintings that would later appear in uh, Chinese Art of the Mongols in 1968 and Eight Dynasties of Chinese Painting in 1980, 81. And so if you look here, the accession number says 1997, but in fact, it was purchased in 1956 and always intended to go to Cleveland. Similarly, this Wang Yan painting of quail and sparrows purchased in 1960. And here is just a brief look at what one of these caro cards looks like. And I wanna thank Jenny Rada for um, facilitating my access to these cards back in 2012. And I'm so thankful I made many copies because they're now sequestered in the Musée Guimet in Paris. Uh, but they are a, a trove of information. This just sort of gives you a sense of how these things circulated. This is the card for bamboo and quails. And uh, you can see catalog numbers for um, these kinds of paintings different numbers, different um, catalog numbers associated with publications, and then who it goes to. So it went to Eli Lilly in Indianapolis, then the Freer, then Stephen Junkunk in Chicago, Boston, Kansas City, finally to Sherman Lee in Cleveland, and look how the prices change. Um, and then you see it on the paid list. Now, looking at this, you would think that it was an institutional purchase, but if you look a little further, you find out that it was Mrs. Perry. And largely, these kinds of this kind of information came from my research on conservation files at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which indicate when paintings came into the museum to be conserved or examined, um, which is very different than when the final purchase or acquisition happens. Here's another one associated with Cleveland and Mrs. Perry. Uh, one of my choices for the cover of the front of the t-shirt. Uh, and then here is uh, the single painting I've been able to trace to the Royal Ontario Museum purchased in 1957, likely 56, but has a 57 accession number uh, attributed to Tang Yin. So this exhibition continued um, into Stanford and other places. And uh, let me just wrap up by showing you a few more paintings and where they ended up here in the Norton from 1961, 1967, Wang Guxiang in Germany, and in Honolulu from 1972, going again through C.C. Wong. And finally, a wonderful Taoist painting uh, that ended up in the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And I'll close by saying, if all of this kind of thing is of interest to you, I point out two recent publications recent issue of the Journal of Art Market Studies and a uh, edited volume by Jason Guo, uh, both recently published. Thank you.